Hey guys, welcome back. Mama Dr. Jones, OBGYN, and Mom24. I'm so excited for this video because it's the last video of 2019, which was the year I started YouTube. It has been a crazy, awesome, amazing year, and I really have you guys to thank for that. If you're new here, I post on Monday mornings. This video is from a YouTube channel called Real Families who did a docu-series on three strange pregnancies. Today we are talking about the final one. We've learned a lot in the other episodes. After you finish this one, if you want to go watch those, you can do that. If you want to check out the original video, the link will be below. I am post-call, which means I worked for the past 24 hours. We do get to sleep during that time, sometimes more than others. Every time I film a video when I'm post-call, you guys either say, Oh my God, you're so exhausted. Take a break. It's fine. I'll take a nap later. Or you say, your makeup looks so great today. It's because I'm overcompensating for the fact that I have giant dark circles under my eyes. I really wanted to make a video for you guys today. I'll rest when I can. Sarah and Shane Reinfelder of Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, are just beginning their life together as husband and wife when they get an unexpected surprise. I got pregnant within the first three months of our marriage. We weren't actually planning for kids. We were both kind of shocked. Who knows what they were doing for birth control, whether this was a birth control failure or truly they just were not using contraceptives. But I often have patients tell me we're not trying to get pregnant, but they're not using anything to prevent pregnancy. And those are kind of the same thing. There's lots of things that prevent pregnancy. I've done a whole video about all of those options. If you would like to check that out, feel free. And they said that what was happening from the cramping was that she was miscarrying. I was in shock. I had to sit there and try and tell myself, this is really actually happening. You know, you can't do anything about it. But while Sarah's at the hospital, the doctor discovers something even more devastating. She's like, well, you have two uteruses. Did you know that? They don't go into detail about how they diagnosed this, but she does say that the doctor asked, did you know you have two uteruses? Kind of an interesting question. I feel like if you knew that, you probably would have thrown that in the conversation somewhere. They also say something like, oh, this is even more devastating than the fact that she's having a miscarriage. I just would disagree with that. This is a Mullerian anomaly, meaning a change in the way that the uterus develops. We'll probably get into more detail about how that happens in just a little bit, but it's not more devastating of a diagnosis than a miscarriage. I don't like the way that they phrase that. This isn't devastating, certainly in comparison to what she's describing as a miscarriage that was heartbreaking to her. Called uterine didelphus and occurs in less than 0.05% of women in the world. Let's talk a little bit about how a uterus becomes didelphus or double. When you're a teeny tiny embryo and growing into a fetus, you have two sides of your reproductive organs that are growing and developing, two sides of the uterus, two sides of the cervix, and two sides of the top two thirds of the vaginal walls. And as the tiny embryo is developing, they grow together and then they fuse in the middle. And once they fuse in the middle, septum part where they've grown together goes away and they become one structure. If anything goes wrong in the course of those two sides coming together and losing their separation, you can have a variety of different structures related to this. What happens at the same time as the uterus coming together is the kidneys are developing. So oftentimes patients who have a problem with the development of the uterus, even though they aren't physically connected, they'll also have either one kidney or an abnormal kidney or something like that because something just went awry in the time of embryologic development when those things are happening. Hearing the inner ear also develops at the same time. Those three things can kind of go hand in hand. That is why you miscarried. I would say that based on what they've told us here, you can't decide that she definitely miscarried because of this just with an early miscarriage. The muscle tends to be thinner and weaker, almost always resulting in miscarriage or preterm delivery. She told us because of my uterine abnormality that I was probably never gonna be able to have kids in my life, ever. Is it true that if you take a population of people who have what we call Mullerian anomalies, where the uterus has formed in a shape that is not typical, they have a slight increased risk of miscarriage and a slight increased risk of infertility. Yes, that is true. 
But is it true that if you take everyone with a didelphus uterus, which is the duplicated uterus like they just showed, and you look at their outcomes that most of them never can have a baby or get pregnant, that's not true. It's not a sentence to never have a baby. It's just a little more complicated sometimes. I don't like the way they phrase that at all. This is a side note, but I feel like this is problematic because oftentimes people are told information like this and what the physician means is it slightly increases your risk of miscarriage or infertility and what the patient hears because of poor communication on the part of the person giving the information is I can't get pregnant or I won't get pregnant or I'm never having a child. Even if you don't want to have a baby, hearing I can't have a baby can do one of two things. Get in your mind and just make you really worry about it and focus on it. But also it could make you say, well, like I can't get pregnant, so I don't need birth control or I don't need contraception. I don't want a baby, but that doctor said I can't get pregnant. I just don't, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. There's very, 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 very few diagnoses where I would ever tell a patient you can't get pregnant and thus you don't need any kind of contraception. It's just really rare because there's always a small chance. And in the case of a didelphus, I would say there's more than just a small chance. I've talked about this for like 10 minutes now, so I need to move on. Pretty much all that was running through our mind was how much we wanted to have babies of our own and how much we wanted to have our own family. And it felt like someone just completely came in and just ripped it all away from you. I thought it was completely just the end. You know, I told Shay, I was like, I feel like I'm pregnant, but I, there's no way I'm pregnant. And he was like, no, you're not pregnant. We broke down and got a pregnancy test and it popped up positive. And I was like, okay, but you know, it could be false positive. You know, they said I couldn't have kids. So we ended up going to the doctor, sure enough. Okay, case in point. However, this information was initially conveyed to them and what I would venture to say is inaccurate, honestly, was confusing. She both thought I can't get pregnant and I will never carry a pregnancy. This is terrible communication. Do you hear in her voice like she was surprised and in this situation, it's good, she's happy, but at the same time, you would like to be preparing your body for pregnancy, optimizing your health, starting a prenatal vitamin, all of those things that you do when you're trying to get pregnant. But she, because of how she'd been told this information, assumed she could not get pregnant. Can you imagine if it was flipped around in a patient who didn't want to be pregnant rather than being happily shocked with the outcome that they would be devastated because they hadn't been preventing pregnancy when they didn't actually want to be pregnant. And she could have gone a very long time without getting any prenatal care. And that's not good for anyone, but it's particularly not good in someone who has had an increased risk of complications related to pregnancy because of the shape of their uterus. Also, it said she was only five months later from the miscarriage that she got pregnant, so clearly she isn't having trouble getting pregnant. Who knows what the outcome of this pregnancy will be, but she is not having difficulty conceiving. Sure enough. There's a little baby baby. And we about jumped out of our skin. Given her high risk condition, Sarah is put on strict bed rest and monitored closely. As the weeks progress, the couple's hopes begin to grow. I'm never gonna get this video edited. I keep stopping it. Strict bed rest, I have a problem with this also. There are a few pregnancy conditions that would make me want to have a patient decrease their activity level, but study after study after study has shown that there is little to no benefit from putting patients on complete bed rest and that there could be an increased risk of complications like blood clots in the legs or lungs, which can be life-threatening. I'm not her doctor. And if you have this condition and you're pregnant, you've been told otherwise, don't take my advice, take your own doctor's advice. But if she was my patient, I would tell her, there's no reason you need to be on complete bed rest. Who knows if her doctor actually said that or if they are editing that in to be dramatic, but that's not been something that we recommend as OBGYNs based on the scientific evidence for a long time. There are certainly rare exceptions to that. The baby's fine. They basically told her there is a slight chance that you could carry this one long enough that we could do a C-section and the baby could survive. That means hitting a minimum of 27 or 28 weeks. You guys are gonna stop watching immediately because I just keep interrupting it, but I need to comment on this again. 27 or 28 weeks is not the minimum gestational age. Certainly getting to 27 or 28 weeks or way past that is ideal. 
but what we call viability is 24 weeks. 23 to 24 weeks is considered peri viability, meaning there's a subset of babies that are big enough that they have survived at that gestational age. It's largely dependent on birth weight and not gestational age because gestational age is a little bit inaccurate. The biggest predictor of how well a very preterm baby does is largely its weight. So I know they just said that in passing, but it's not right. And I don't like when these shows put inaccurate information. I feel like this is the most inaccurate one yet, and we're only a few minutes in, so we better keep watching. Defying all odds, Sarah makes it. And on April 8th, 2008, she and Shane welcome a healthy six pound, 10 ounce baby William into the world. We had our little family and we were happy with it. I don't know what that picture was that they just showed, but that wasn't a healthy six pound baby boy. I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that they're about to talk about another pregnancy in which she has a very preterm baby. I don't know if that was purposeful foreshadowing or someone just threw the photo in, but that's not a healthy six pound term baby. Three months after the birth of their miracle baby, Sarah is pregnant again. There are two. There is a baby in each uterus. This is extremely rare. Only about 70 women in the world have ever been known to be pregnant with a baby in each of two wombs, and only a small percentage of those pregnancies have made it to delivery. What has happened with her is that she has gotten pregnant in each side. Now, importantly, this is also really close in time proximity to her last C-section. That would be concerning to me in anyone because it slightly increases the risk of preterm delivery, but it's particularly concerning to me in a patient who has an abnormally shaped uterus and who is only three months out from a C-section when they're diagnosed now with a, another pregnancy and in this case, a twin pregnancy. So I'm concerned, I would say her risk of preterm delivery in this pregnancy based on her uterine shape, the fact that there's twins, and how close in proximity we are to her last C-section is very, very high. Some of the special precautions that were necessary with Sarah was to make sure that she was at bed rest and not doing anything strenuous because with her decreased activity, we could decrease the risk of preterm labor. Obviously, based on what I've already said, I would challenge the idea that the bed rest caused this to go well based on literature we have on bed rest. However, this is an extremely unique situation and I would have no problem telling a patient, you need to drastically reduce your activity levels for this pregnancy. You got pregnant three months after a C-section, you have two uteruses and you have a baby in each side. The fact of the matter with that is that we don't know what your risk is. We can only presume that the risk of preterm delivery, extreme preterm delivery, or even middle of the second trimester miscarriage is quite a bit higher than an average person. Here is a study and it says, basically in a review of literature in twin pregnancies, bed rest slash reduction of physical activity does not prolong gestation. I think in a really high risk pregnancy like this, where you have multiple things increasing your risk of preterm delivery, that being on strict bed rest increases your risk more than it's worth, but that reducing your activity level or not performing strenuous activities makes sense because there's no evidence of harm right now. So I'm good with that. But again, I just want to say literature is not supportive of complete bed rest and we can cause harm with it. So I don't know, maybe I'm just um, overzealous with that, but I just, I think it's not okay. Doctors Headmark and Pond know they must prepare for the delivery of two babies from separate uteri, something few doctors in the world have ever done before. When we got to 32 weeks and Sarah's health was deteriorating, ultimately we knew we we're gonna have to make a decision soon. Okay, yeah, super interesting. How are we going to deliver these babies? 32 weeks is awesome. Any twin pregnancy, getting past that 30 week, 32 week mark is great. But with her, I mean, that is amazing. I suspect they will do a C-section and it will be more difficult than you anticipate when you just think about it to figure out exactly where to make your incisions to safely deliver each baby from each side. It seems like that shouldn't be difficult in that it should be straightforward. But as somebody who does C-sections and has seen what the pelvis and a didelphus uterus looks like, 
I expect that that's going to be a very complicated surgery. I've done thousands of C-sections, but not one side by side. When I entered the abdomen, I decided to deliver the baby on the left first. That just seemed anatomically the easier one to get to first. And all of a sudden we hear the best scream I've ever heard in my life. Dr. Fry, we have baby in. We heard Kaylin come out screaming her lungs out. That baby looked like a great size, especially for a 33-week baby. Another thing that we worry about in someone who has a didelphus uterus, uterus, even if the baby is only one baby in one side, is the risk of the baby not growing well, being too small or growth restricted. So I don't know, they haven't said the sizes, but that baby in the pictures looked to be a decent size for that gestational age. Delivery of the first baby unexpectedly causes the weight of the second to shift and rotate, putting the second uterus dangerously out of reach. With extreme care, Dr. Hedmark and her team attempt to manually twist the second uterus back into position. You just focus. You focus on what you know you need to do, and you just concentrate. I like what she said about you just focus and do what you need to do. That's kind of how I pr approach emergencies. If you let it get in your head, like, oh my gosh, there's a baby here, this is a life, something terrible is gonna happen, all these things can go wrong. Like you're not going to be a good physician or a good surgeon. And so you just have to look at the situation, take it all in, figure out what needs to be done and get it done. What they're describing here is basically once they removed the baby from the other side, there was suddenly a lot of room. When those uteri are very separate, if you just suddenly remove a bunch of volume from the other side, what I think they're describing happening is that the baby twisted like this and just rotated all of the anatomy with it. And the problem with that is that it makes it really hard to decide where to safely make an incision without causing harm to baby, to mom, to all the structures that live near where we're operating, like the bladder and the ureters and the bowel and all those things. After struggling for nearly two frightening minutes, doctors finally reach the second baby. I would say that two minutes from the time they recognize that to getting baby out is really pretty good. Kudos to them, that's awesome. And a little bit terrifying. When you see these babies and they come out crying and you just think, this is just truly amazing. I will never see this again in my life and this is why I do this job. The twins spend seven weeks in the neonatal intensive care unit before going home. I like to think that every pregnant mom has a right to believe her pregnancy is the most special. But some things are just so unusual that they do stand out and you can't help but be amazed at what nature can do. Again, with not getting all the information, just like in the last episode, I want to know how much those babies weighed because they look to be decent size. Although in this picture here, they do look a little smaller than in the other picture. <sighs> look at me being very needy, needing medical information from medical documentaries. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you'd like to see more like it. Be kind to yourself, to each other, to me. In the comments, be kind, and I will see you next time. Next year, I'll see you next year. Unless you follow me on Instagram, in which case I'll probably see you again this year, but. All right, thanks, bye guys. I'm actually gonna leave this time.